Cadillac Cheetah. The car behind us is actually the Allen Green uh, Cheetah, but they do share the same wide rear end that was added uh, between 64 and 65. But uh, with me today is Mike Jones, and he was involved with the Cheetah with Bill Thomas, and he drove it the first time in competition at the Times Grand Prix. And David is with us because he was the mechanic on the car when Dixon Cadillac sold it to Phil, uh, Jim Phillips in Las Vegas and he uh, prepared the car for Jim. So I think what we want to do is start out with Mike because he was involved with the Dixon car the first. Uh, yeah, I was uh, working for Bill at the time and uh, doing uh, some work on uh, the Corvair products that uh, he was known for. And uh, the, uh, the Dixon Cadillac car uh, was uh, designed really for the street. It had a stock engine. And uh, I got a call one day from Bill saying that uh, the uh, Dixon Cadillac had to enter the car in a professional competition uh, in order for, uh, to legitimatize their tax status, and uh, so it was, uh, the Times Grand Prix was coming up, and uh, we uh, took the car out to the track, and uh, they explained that they didn't expect me to qualify, but we had to make a qualifying attempt in order to legitimatize uh, the situation. Basically, the, the preparation was to put a dual air meter on instead of the single air meter, and that was about it? Yeah, there was basically stock, and uh, so nobody had any high hopes for it, including myself, but uh, went out and did a qualifying attempt, which uh, should satisfy everything, and uh, went home. I wasn't going to go out of, to the track on uh, Sunday, and uh, I was reading the, uh, the times, looking to see what the qualifying times actually were and was uh, stunned to see that I qualified uh, midfield. And I think that was due in part to uh, Dan Gurney and Foyt, uh, both having trouble with their cars. And uh, so they had to run a consolation race, whereas if you'd qualified on the day of qualifying, why, uh, you didn't have to do that. And. Uh, so I got my gear together <laughs> real quick, and uh, my wife and I and our oldest daughter, uh, who was probably about four at the time, um, drove out to Riverside and uh, got the car uh, positioned on the grid, ready to go, and the, uh, the flag dropped, and uh, there was an enormous wreck in uh, turn one. Cars were going up in the dirt bank. You couldn't see where you were going because of the dust and dirt. Uh, the preceding cars and uh, the flag, or the race was uh, red flagged, and uh, they brought out uh, a cleanup crew to get rid of all of the uh, wreckage and the uh, oil and whatnot uh, in the turn. And uh, then, after applying all the grease sweep. They uh, decided that the most expeditious way to get rid of that would be to bring in uh, Frank Arciero's uh, helicopter and they'd just blow it away. And uh, so the helicopter came in and uh, shortly thereafter got tangled up in the wires that went across the track and the helicopter crashed and turned on. So at this point, my wife was saying, Do you really want to do this? <laughs> And uh, so and eventually they got everything back in order and uh, the race was started and uh, we're doing surprisingly well uh, for a stock car 
and uh, we're up to six uh, at one point, and then we begin to have uh, some fuel delivery problems due to debris in the tank, and uh, they had to park it. But uh, it was fun while it lasted, and uh, an interesting story. <laughs> Okay. Well, after the Times Grand Prix, uh, Jack Gutenberg, who owned Dixon Cadillac, and Ralph Picard, who was his used car manager, uh, they decided it would be fun if they would race the car in some of our local uh, cow club races. So Ralph and, and Jack, uh, who basically drove... Eldorados or Coupe de Ville's or whatever, that's that's what they were used to. They haul this thing out to Riverside to the uh, Cal Club Drivers Training School and they march in and they say, we'd like to get a, uh, a competition license. And the guys behind the desk say, oh, that's good, what, what, that's fine. And gave them a little information, said, okay, what car did you bring? We brought a Cheetah. And what do you normally drive? I drive a Coupe de Ville. Yeah, they said that was the expression on the on the trainer's face was priceless. But the first time I actually the first time I came in contact with the car was when uh, Jack first had it. It was in in street uh, configuration, and and I was a the Corvette club I was in. I was the competition director because I was racing a solid axle Corvette, and they brought out the Great Western Exhibition Center in street trim with the license plate just kind of hung over the rear uh, fender, over rear uh, gas filler. And everybody was all excited and he went around the course once and then went home. And then I saw when Mike was driving at the Times Grand Prix, but the next time I saw it for real was at Del Mar uh, at a cow club race after, uh, actually at San Diego region race, after they'd gotten their license. and. Uh, Jack came over and I was telling him about the course and what to watch for and there was a, there was a big long sweeping 180 degree uh, turn down at Del Mar and when he came out of it, the, it was all in a parking lot and it was very rough there and it was hard to get the traction down uh, and I told Jack about that and then after he did his run I asked him and he says, oh it was fine, everything was good. He said, I didn't have any trouble at all getting traction, down, any power down out of that corner. I said, well that can't be very right because you got a whole lot more power than my little 283's got. And so I pulled the spark plugs for him and uh, all of them were like absolutely white, like they'd never come out of the box. Uh, so I, I then took the injector and checked the nozzles and maybe left over from your race, the screens were full of junk. And uh, when I cleaned those up and then he went out for the afternoon race and he came back in and he said, you're right, it's real rough out there. <laughs> So whenever uh, Rolf and, and Jack would take the car to a, to a race, why would, they would pit close to us, and if they had any problems, I would try to help or uh, give whatever support I could to it. And then it, uh, in January of uh, 1965, uh, Jack called me up and says, would you like to drive it? <laughs> of course I wanted to drive it. Uh, so we took it out to Willow Springs uh, for a test day and I went around a couple laps kind of just figuring out what was going on uh, and then the third lap I decided okay I'll just see what the thing will do a little bit and I got into turn 9 which is an increasing, decreasing radius right hand turn it's just kind of tricky and I was in faster than I wanted and in my Corvette I could just lift the throttle and it was no problem well, I lifted the throttle in the Corvette and it snapped 720 to the inside and I'm looking back at the tourist, of course, in a big cloud of dust. And what happened? Uh, that was kind of my inter introduction to the fact that, that they were a little hairy. So we ran that weekend, and that was the last weekend that Jerry Titus drove the uh, friendly Chevrolet, aka factory car, because he blew up on Sunday. Uh, so I can say that I actually finished ahead of Jerry Titus and achieved in one race, <laughs> for whatever that's really worth. Uh, then they brought the car to um, to uh, Pomona, I believe it was in March, and we had a lot of rain that weekend. And coming out of the tunnel where everybody sees the pictures uh, from Pomona, 
that's the favorite uh, picture people like to take. Uh, there was kind of a puddle there, and uh, Jack lost it there, spun it around, and he and he hit a tree, and it just kind of it didn't do any serious damage, but it basically tore the left rear fender off the car. Uh, so he didn't do that. Then I saw the car again at Santa Barbara in in the races, and it was still a small block, uh, basically stock car. Then the next time I heard from them and saw it, they had put the um, big block 396 in a rock pressure M22 transmission in. And Jack's story was, Jack Goodman, or no, Ralph Picard's story was that uh, he was a used car manager, was that one day a box appeared in Dixon Cadillac, actually two boxes, and one of them had a rock pressure and the other one had a 396 in it. And in the late summer of, of 1965, this was exciting stuff because they had just come out with the big block and the Corvette guys wanted it. So they put it, uh, they had Bill Thomas put it in the Cheetah and they were taking it up to San Luis Obispo to test. Uh, would I want to come along and help? Heck yeah, you bet. So we, I showed up there at uh, San Luis Obispo and they rolled it off and they opened the hood. And I saw the big block and I was prepared for that. What I wasn't prepared for was the fact they had two radiators in the car, one in the standard upright position and another laid over at about 45 degrees. And uh, the things I remember about that weekend was we had a heck of a time trying to what we call burp it. It kept keeping an air bubble and then it wanted to run real hot. And the other is it wanted to stay in gear. It was stuck. It would you'd get it. I think it was second, although I'm not sure. And Rolf, who was driving, would come in and we'd have to get it out of gear and then he'd take off again and run some more. And that was the, I guess, shakedown cruise because they were going to run in the 1965 Times Grand Prix, uh, which was the next time I saw the car at the Times Grand Prix. And Rolf qualified, but he was actually slower than you were the year before with the big block. So Jack said, okay, go out, take the green flag, run one full lap so that you've got, you're officially made a lap, and then on the second lap, come in, and we're done, because we're just, that's, that's it. That way he got his appearance money, he got to write the tax thing off, and it was all done. So Rolf came in and got out of the car, and Jack told me, he says, get in it, put it back behind the pit wall. And being a driver, that was not an easy thing to haul and get, get in a perfectly good running car and drive it back behind the pit wall. So I did, and that was really the last time I saw the car, and it was sold to Jim Phillips uh, in uh, Las Vegas, and I think that's they were where your part of the story comes starts That's about to where up. I entered the story, I guess. Uh, uh, kind of got a call from a friend of mine and said that uh, Jim was looking for somebody to go along with him on some of his road trips to go racing, and he wanted somebody to change plugs, change oil, you know, do all the dirty work. And, uh, hey, I'm a young kid, why not? Let's go do it. So we proceeded to travel here and there I had another fellow that helped me uh, drive the tow car, and we just started towing every race we could get to. And Jim would either fly there or he'd drive there in his personal car, and uh, we went everywhere. Uh, he's up to Oregon to Willow Springs and watch the dust fly and go home. And up to Oregon, watch the rain come down for hours, drive back home. Uh, but we went everywhere with that car, everywhere we could, and uh, did pretty good. Uh, we won, actually, first place, one race, at davis Mountain Air Force Base in Tucson. Uh, but accumulated enough points that Pacific Coast Championship was ours. And I guess uh, I was quite proud of it. I guess it means something. And uh, we had a lot of fun with the car. I took it to the drags, played a little bit with air, had fun with it. Unfortunately, it was not totally competitive at the drag strip because of the rear end gear ratios, and I just managed to tear up clutches consistently with it. But uh, I had fun driving it. Uh, I would love to have been able to keep it. Unfortunately, Jim sold it, 
and uh, I wanted it back so bad. And in that day, the money we sold it for was astronomical amount of money. Today, it doesn't mean squat, but I sure wished I could have bought it back. The uh, car was a lot of fun, ungodly noisy. Uh, a lot of the problems with the overheating, the gear shifting, and transmission problems have all been sorted out because we had no trouble uh, physically driving it. It's just trying to make it stay on the racetrack was an unbelievable problem uh, inherent to the Cheetahs. Unfortunately, I didn't know that till later that all of my chassis work didn't mean squat. The car just would not handle it. Well, David, you, you were a sports racing champion for Pacific Coast region, Correct. but you didn't run in the, in the national runoffs run -off. because he sold the car he like sold, what, a week or two just before the runoffs? It was just weeks before the runoffs and I don't think he really wanted to run in the runoffs anyway. Uh, and I don't know why, uh, too many years ago to remember, other than he spotted an ad in the back of competition news for a McLaren for sale. Very inexpensive, a brand new one. So hey, an opportunity to sell the Cheetah and buy a McLaren, he jumped on it. So the Cheetah was gone. Well, and I guess that's most of the uh, story of the uh, Dixon Cadillac Cheetah in its competition days because it was, if I understand right, it was sold to a fella in Salt Lake City. Exactly. Who then sold it to a fella in Oregon where it remained until uh, the fella passed away and, and it went into his estate. So there's the, our story on the Dixon card that we remember. and. and uh, we were all there, I think. <laughs>